This morning we're going to uh, look at Hebrews chapter 8. Um, I'm going to read the whole chapter, but uh, we're really going to be focusing on verses 7 through 13 since he sort of begins to open up the topic of Christ's priesthood, which of course we have been looking at, but uh, more aspects of that. But then he turns to the idea that this priest has brought in a covenant which is a better covenant, and we've already seen reasons why, but we're going to uh, delve into that Jeremiah 31 text now. But let me read for you uh, Hebrews chapter 8. The author writes, now the main point in what has been said is this, we have such a high priest who has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister in the sanctuary. And in the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched, not man, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary that this high priest also have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are those who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly things. Just as Moses was warned by God when he was about to erect the tabernacle, for see, he says, that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry by as much as he is also the mediator of a better covenant which has been enacted on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with them, he says, Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. For they did not continue in my covenant and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me from the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. May the Lord bless again his word to our hearing this morning. Now, again, I don't think I need to remind you, but I will, that the author to the Hebrews is helping us to see how much better Jesus is than anything the Old Covenant had to offer, because really, He is the fulfillment of all these things. The author to the Hebrews has shown us that Jesus is, for instance, a better prophet, a better prophet than the prophets of the Old Covenant. Uh, they were men who were moved by the Spirit of God. They spoke from God. And what they wrote was from God, but He is God in our nature. And He came down to reveal God to us and to reveal His will to us. And so you should particularly listen to Him. The author to the Hebrews says that Jesus is better than the angels. Uh, the angels were actually the mediators of the old covenant. It was through them the law was given. But they are servants of the Lord while Jesus Christ is king, the king to whom his father promised that he would defeat all of his enemies. You know, the Lord has actually, by his spirit, defeated you. He's caused you to, to subject yourself to Jesus Christ willingly, and you need to be thankful that he's done that, because if he hadn't, you would have perished in your sins but also because Christ is king, he has this promise that one day all of his enemies are going to be placed under his feet. And you need to be thankful about that as well because those enemies are your enemies. The Lord is going to subdue them. 
The Lord Jesus Christ, the author has said, is better than Moses. Moses was a great man. He was a prophet. He was a priest. And really, for all intents and purposes, he was a king. All the offices were actually wed in him, which is why he was a picture of Jesus Christ. And yet, as great as Moses was, he was only a servant in God's house. But Jesus is a son over that house. It actually belongs to him. And you are a part of that house by God's grace. Jesus is better than Joshua. A Joshua is the one the Lord used to bring the Jews into the land of Canaan. But don't forget that land was only a picture of heaven. It was not the reality. It wasn't heaven itself. Jesus is able to bring you into the real heaven, into heaven itself. And one day, He actually will do that. You will be there by His grace if you are trusting Him to do that. And now the author has turned to the subject of Jesus being a better priest. He is a better priest than the Old Covenant Levitical priests. We saw last week because He is the order of Melchizedek. Remember Melchizedek, the king of righteousness. Melchizedek, the king of peace. Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God the one who is greater than Abraham and Levi, Jesus is a part of that order. Secondly, because as a priest, Jesus is able to do what the Levitical priests could not do. Their whole purpose was to reconcile the people to God. And the author to the Hebrews tells us that the blood and bulls and goats really couldn't do that. Their ministry couldn't do that, but Jesus can. Jesus actually has reconciled you to God if you've trusted Him. Thirdly, He's better because when God put Him in this office, He swore by oath, you are a priest forever, something He did not do for the Levitical priests. And again, fourthly, He is a better priest because He is indestructible. The Levitical priests could not continue to do their work because they were only men. They died. But since Jesus will never die... The author says he always lives to intercede for everyone who will trust in him. If you have trusted him, he intercedes for you. And because the Lord intercedes for you, you are safe forever. Well, now the author goes on to give us one more thing to show us how much better Jesus is. Uh, The fact, remember, that the priesthood and the, um, well, The law regarding the priesthood has changed, uh, which we know is true because God called this priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, from the tribe of Judah rather than from the tribe of Levi. This suggests another change. The change of law, the change of priesthood suggests a change of covenant. Now, the old covenant, again, the covenant to which these Jews were being tempted to to return, was now old, was now obsolete, and was ready to vanish away. And the reason why is because it had been replaced by a new covenant. It's been replaced by a better covenant. It's been replaced by a covenant that has better promises. And really, that's what we want to look at this morning, uh, those better promises and, and the ways in which it's better. And I think we can see that it's better in at least three ways. First of all, the old covenant couldn't change your heart, as we've already seen, but this covenant can. Secondly, the old covenant couldn't cleanse you from your sins. The the blood of bulls and goats could not remove sin. By the way, the author is going to have a lot more to say about that. But the new covenant will take those sins away permanently. And thirdly, the old covenant could not bring you into a saving relationship with God. But Jesus, through the new covenant, can, and He has, if you have trusted in Him. So first of all, the the first covenant, the old covenant, could not change your heart, but the new covenant can. Now, the first thing you need to understand here is that the author is not saying that there was something wrong with the Old Covenant when he says that it, was, that it wasn't faultless. Uh, God did not give to His people a faulty covenant. 
that covenant did exactly what the Lord intended for it to do. And His intention was that it teach them their need of the Lord Jesus Christ, that it teach them their need of His Son. That's basically what Paul was writing to the Galatians when the Galatians, you remember, were faced with a very similar situation. They were being taught by the Judaizers that it's not enough to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You also need to be circumcised and you need to observe the law of Moses. Well, Paul wrote against that position in Galatians 3 verses 19 and verses 21 through 24 to remind us precisely why God gave that covenant in the first place, why the law of Moses, why even circumcision. He says, why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. But the Scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. So why is it that God gave them the law in the first place? Well, we know that God gave us the moral law for one reason, to convince us that we're sinners. We really couldn't know what sin was apart from the law. God showed us what sin was so we could compare it to our lives and see that we actually do fall short. But why did He give the ceremonial law? Well, He gave them that law to show them the only way that those sins could be dealt with. And that was by trusting in His Son, the great high priest who would offer Himself up as an offering for sin. Now, the only fault of this particular covenant of the ceremonial law and the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, was that it couldn't give them the power actually to obey the law or to keep it. And that really wasn't the covenant's fault. That was the people's fault. As you'll see, well, actually, as you've already read in this chapter... God did not find any fault with the covenant, but with the people because they didn't obey the covenant. He says, for finding fault with them. And he says in verse 9, for they did not continue in my covenant and I did not care for them, says the Lord. This is the reason why the old covenant needed to be replaced, at least one of the reasons, and that's because it wasn't able actually to give what it promised, as it were, or at least what it showed them they needed. That's why the new covenant, of course, is also better because it can give what is necessary. It's got a better prophet, a better king and priest who offered a better sacrifice, as well as who lived a perfect life to provide cleansing from sin and a perfect righteousness so that He could give you His Holy Spirit to change your heart so that you would obey. Notice the Lord says in this new covenant, God puts His laws into your mind and He writes them on your hearts. He takes the moral law, not the ceremonial law, but the moral law, His standard of righteousness, that rule of love, and He causes you to fall in love with it so that you will actually live by it. It would not be said of you, you did not continue in my covenant and I did not care for you. The Lord rectifies that problem now. You do continue in His covenant. You do obey Him because you love Him. The old covenant could only point to the one who could bring that change. And we do have to acknowledge that those actually who looked to Jesus Christ in the old covenant were changed. They were saved. But the new covenant actually provides this mediator, the old covenant pointed to, who did this work, the better priest as we've already seen, the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, the first point is the old covenant could not change your heart, but the new covenant can. And that's why 
it's better. Well, secondly, the first covenant or the old covenant couldn't cleanse you from your sins, while the new covenant can and does take them away permanently. Now, this is key, and as I mentioned before, in the next couple of chapters, the author to the Hebrews is going to show us how important this forgiveness is to our relationship with the Lord. But I want you to notice the words that are spoken here. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. This is the reason why you're saved, at least one of the main reasons, because your sins are what alienated you from God. It's what made the separation between you. That's what God in His justice had to punish in you. That is what would have weighed you down into hell forever. But in the new covenant, this is exactly what He laid upon His Son on the cross, and His Son took them away forever. Now, we're going to, again, uh, explore this. The author to the Hebrews is going to explore this more in the next couple of chapters, actually beginning with the beginning of chapter 8. And he's going to show us how, you know, what the animal sacrifices that were offered by the Levitical priests were actually able to do and what they weren't able to do. There is a certain sense in which they cleanse the flesh, he says, ceremonially so that God could be around His people, at least as He sees a picture of the forgiveness of His Son, even if the people didn't receive that forgiveness although we do need to recognize that some of them did. But it was so that God could continue to dwell among His people and continue to work with them until He could bring His Son into the world. But those sacrifices could not take away sin by themselves. They couldn't. Now, it's true that if the one who offered that sacrifice looked beyond the animal and the blood of that animal to the blood of Jesus Christ, the Messiah who was coming, his sin was certainly forgiven, but very few people actually did that because the Lord granted that blessing to very few. In the new covenant, the Lord provides a better sacrifice, one that actually does take away sin and that takes them away once and for all and forever. And that makes the new covenant a better covenant than the old covenant. Finally, the Old Covenant also was faulty in that it could not bring you into a saving relationship with God. But Jesus, through the New Covenant, has done that. Uh, one thing you might have noticed in this passage that I read that was that part of the responsibility that you would have had as a member of the Old Covenant community was to encourage your brothers and your sisters through the types and the shadows which the Lord has given in the ceremonial law through all the sacrifices, to press on to know the Lord, not just to know about Him, but actually to come into relationship with Him through faith in the one who was coming. But again, that covenant really couldn't provide that relationship because it wasn't able to take away the offense. It couldn't take away the guilt, couldn't take away the sin, it couldn't change your heart as we've already seen. And as long as you're rebelling against the Lord, as long as you're unwilling to submit to Him, as long as you're His enemy, you can't come into a relationship with Him. At least not this kind of relationship. You'll have a relationship, but it's going to be an adversarial relationship. You're at war with each other. You can't even accept the offer that He makes to you of salvation through His Son because you don't want it. Your heart is steeled against Him. But what that old covenant, that first covenant couldn't do, weak as it was through your flesh, God did in the new covenant by sending His Son to die on the cross, by giving you His Spirit, by putting His law into your mind and writing it on your hearts, by changing your nature and causing you to put down the weapons of your warfare against Him. Now, that's what paves the way for you to know God in this kind of relationship, for you to become His people, for God to become your God, for you to be adopted as His sons and daughters. The Bible says here 
that all who are a part of this covenant through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ actually know the Lord. Notice we don't have to encourage each man his brother, each man his neighbor anymore saying, know the Lord, because all will know me. Everyone who has trusted in Jesus Christ is a part of this covenant, has these blessings, is in this intimate relationship with God. Because in this covenant, He actually provides the means by which you might draw near to Him through His Son. You see, this is the bottom line, isn't it? The new covenant actually brings us into relationship with God, which is the kind in which we know Him. And that, that doesn't mean just knowing who He is and knowing what He's like. It means knowing Him in a personal way as your Father and Him uh, owning you as His sons and His daughters. Now, it is, is it any wonder that this new covenant that the Lord has brought has made the old obsolete? Is it any wonder that the Lord did away with it? You, I don't know if, you, if I actually brought this up in the context of this particular study in the book of Hebrews, but this was written around 68 AD, which is very close to a very, uh, a very prominent date. Uh, that we've looked at many times, 70 A.D., when the Lord brings His judgment against Jerusalem, when He destroys the temple and the whole thing is dismantled. The author to the Hebrews says in verse 13 of this chapter when he says a new covenant, or when he, when he said a new covenant, He has made the first obsolete, but whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. What did he mean by that? What he meant was 70 A.D. is just around the corner, and the Lord has already determined that He's going to tear this temple down. As a matter of fact, um, Jesus said as much in the Olivet Discourse that was recorded in Matthew, uh, Matthew's Gospel. That was about to take place. This covenant could not do what was necessary to be due necessary to be done, which is bring us into relationship with God, but the new covenant can do that. It can bring us into that relationship because it's based on a work that is actually able to do it, the work of the better priest in offering a better sacrifice to reconcile us to God through the forgiveness of our sins and the changing of our hearts. And I do want to remind you again that the importance of getting the gospel out, the importance of our receiving it for ourselves is because this is the only way that God has provided for us to come into this relationship with Him. You can't come in through the old covenant. You certainly can't come in through false religions. Being a faithful Mormon or a JW is not going to reconcile you to God because that is not the way that God has provided. He has provided only in this way through His Son, the true Jesus Christ, through faith in His name and repentance of sins. And by the way, that's the reason why this book is so full of warnings. We're going to see some very severe warnings yet, even beyond the uh, Hebrews chapter 6 passage, which is the unpardonable sin. Warnings not to turn away from the only door of salvation, the only way you can be reconciled to God, but encouragements to press on to know Him to press on to serve Him, because if you turn away from Him, you will still see Him, but you will see Him as judge, and He will condemn you for your sins. But if you do receive Him, and if you do press on to know Him and serve Him, you will see Him, but you will see Him as a gracious Father who will welcome you as His dear children into His eternal kingdom. So again, this passage asks you the question this morning, do you know Him? Do you know that your sins are forgiven through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Is the evidence there? Is His law in your mind? As He says in the new covenant, it will be. Is it written on your heart? And how do you know whether it's written on your heart? Well, you can know when your life begins to conform to that righteous standard because that is what you desire. You can know when you're becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way you can really know that you are His and that you are part of this new covenant. You have to love Him and it has to be a love that goes beyond just a desire that doesn't actually change your life. 
It has to be a desire that does, that changes the whole course of your life. So you're no longer going the way of the world. You're no longer following Satan and the, the prince of the power of the air. But now you're following Jesus Christ as he told you you must be willing if you would be his disciple to pick up your cross, to die to yourself and to follow after him. That's how you can know the law is written on your heart. That's how you can know you have the Spirit of God is when you desire to do what the Lord actually calls you to do. Well, if you do have that desire, you are blessed. You're a part of the new covenant. God has had mercy upon you. But if you don't, recognize this morning that God can change you and He can make you willing. And He is the only one who can. But you do have to come to Him. You do have to turn from your sins. You do have to trust in Him. And if you do, He will save you and He will give you the grace you need actually to walk with Him. May the Lord grant that all of us, by His grace, would be partakers of this covenant. I should mention, if we're not under this covenant, we're not necessarily reverting to the old covenant, but we are under the broken covenant of works, the curse that Adam brought upon us. This is the only way to escape that curse. You have to trust Jesus and turn from your sins or you will perish. So trust in the Lord. He welcomes you to come. He calls you to come. He commands you to come. He won't turn you away. The only thing that's going to stop you is you. So you need to pray that God would overcome your heart by His Holy Spirit and bring you to Himself. Well, let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do what He has called us to do this morning.